church i want to welcome all of you to the fellowship of forest High baptist church we are happy to have you children to log in to worship with us today it is my understanding that we have guests joining us from quite a distance i mean from the other side of the world <laughs> to all our guests I want to tell you something our former pastor used to say. We hope that we are a blessing to you as much as you are a blessing to us today by visiting us. And to Dr. Gogger, we are glad you are here with us today and we're looking forward to hearing from you later. Welcome back to Forest High Baptist Church. Amen. Our deacon, We'll now open the service with the call to worship and prayer. Amen. Deacon. Amen. Thank you, Brother Kofi. Let's go to the Heavenly Father this morning in prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come as disciples of you on dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the opportunity, dear Heavenly Father, to be servants of yours as well, dear Heavenly Father. We come this morning, dear Heavenly Father, to hear a message from Brother Gogger, dear Heavenly Father. We also come this morning, dear Heavenly Father, praying for our pastor, dear Heavenly Father, and the First Lady, dear Heavenly Father, asking for that you place a, a healing hand on Brother Jones, dear Heavenly Father, and keep Sister Jones strength, give her the strength that she needs in order to take care of him as well. We come also praying for our congregation, dear Heavenly Father, praying that their ears may be open, dear Heavenly Father, to hear the message and what's going to be delivered to you this to us this morning, dear Heavenly Father, praying also that the eyes may be open, dear Heavenly Father, so they may see, dear Heavenly Father, as well as hear the word also, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we ask that you touch Pastor John Gogger, dear Heavenly Father, as he delivered this word this morning, dear Heavenly Father. We come praying for the sick as well, dear Heavenly Father, that you continue to heal those. We come praying, praying for the world, dear Heavenly Father, as this COVID-19 goes around the world, dear Heavenly Father. We know that you are still in control, dear Heavenly Father, and always will be. From the foundations of the world, dear Heavenly Father, until the end, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we know there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, dear Heavenly Father. We rejoice in that, dear Heavenly Father. It's in Jesus' name that I pray this prayer. Amen. 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 As I come this morning, you said the call of worship scripture, Brother Kofi. Yes. It's going to be from the book of James, dear Heavenly Father. It's going to start in chapter 1, dear Heavenly Father. And the verses are going to be from 1 on down to verse, verses 8. And it reads as follows. James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Greetings. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall unto verse trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produced patience. Verse 4, but let patience have its perfect works, which you may be, which, which, excuse me, I'll start over. Verse 4, but let patience have its perfect works, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberty and without reproach and it will be given to him. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts 
It's like a wave of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. Verse 8, he is a doubtful-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Amen? Amen. Ask in faith, don't waver. Amen? Amen. Uh, before we uh, hear the announcement, uh, we will hear a hymn, uh, going to be uh, a piano instrumental, uh, and the lyric provided by uh, Kalek Brassi, just like uh, Brother Joe, No More Wood. Uh, next, we will hear the announcement from uh, uh, Sister Angel Lewis. Good morning, everybody. I want to welcome everybody to Forest Heights Baptist Church this morning. And those visitors that we have, we welcome you. And we pray that you will join us again next Sunday. Um, we also have Bible study on Wednesday. And I'm sure you would like to join us for that, too. You're having a great time in Bible study. Um, the announcements for the week are as follows. There will be 
church council meeting tomorrow at 7 p.m. tentatively. It's depending on Reverend Jones. And um, uh, this morning he said to let everyone know that he's um, getting better and he asked you to pray for him and Jerry as we always will. Um, let's see, Bible study this Wednesday, the topic is fellowship. So have your Bibles ready and be ready to jump into the word of God and participate. Um, the only other announcement is that offerings are still being collected on Wednesdays from 12 to 1 p.m. and on Saturdays from 10 to 12 p.m. And you can always go online and make your um, offering. Go to the Forsyth Baptist Church website. And I think those are the announcements. Um, that's it for me. I, I will be singing the special today. So uh, in just a few seconds, I'm going to give you a song. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Dr. Angie. Yes, today you'll be here. Uh, you will be wearing both hats. So yes. <laughs> uh, up next, we will hear uh, the solo from Angie Lewis. <laughs> the name of the song is called, some, some words say, I made a vow or a vow. And this is the first song that I ever sang in church, a cappella, because I can't find the music to it. <laughs> so I hope you're blessed by it. <laughs> I made a vow to the Lord. I made a vow to the Lord. I promised him I would go every step step of the way cause i made a vow to the lord did you make a vow to the lord did you make a vow to the Lord? Did you promise him you would go every step, step of the way? Did you make a vow? to the Lord. Sometimes, oh, Satan, he gets on my tracks and I try so many times to turn him back Cause I know I've got to go every step, step of the way. Cause I made a vow to the Lord. Yes, I made a vow. Did you make a vow? Will you make a vow to the Lord? Amen. Thank you, Angie. Amen. amen. Uh, thank you, Sister Angie. Amen. amen. All right. Uh, up next. We will hear uh, the message from our guest speaker, uh, Dr. John Garger. Uh, this is not the first time we will hear the Lord's message from him, but obviously it is the first time we will hear from Zoom. So, uh, Dr. Garger is coming to us from uh, Baptist Convention of Maryland and Delaware. You can see that you know, on his shirt. But he also teaches at uh, Liberty University. Uh, Dr. Garger, the microphone is yours. Why, thank you, sir. It's uh, a privilege to be uh, with you all 
uh, again. Uh, this is the first time I've ever preached at a church without leaving my house. And um, uh, I, I, I miss being with you because you have warm fellowship. I know we would have had a lot more singing and I'd get some good hugs afterwards if I was down there. Uh, but I do have one advantage. It certainly saved me a lot of driving time. And uh, this is the way it's going to be. So I'm, I'm just delighted um, to, um, to be able to do this. The brother that, uh, that called and asked me about this uh, teased me just for a second. He said, we're inviting you, uh, not any name being mentioned, but he said, we're inviting you to come and drive uh, 200 miles to come and preach at our church. And I thought, oh, <laughs> I thought it was going to be by Zoom, <laughs> and it is by Zoom. Praise God. So I want to commend you for what you're doing and just report to you from the Baptist Convention of Maryland, Delaware, that uh, as we look at the, the bigger picture of what's going on in all the churches, there's a lot about which to be encouraged. Uh, we weren't sure what was going to happen because we've never done any of this before. And uh, different churches are doing it different ways, uh, but the, most churches have found ways to still get together. Facebook, YouTube, uh, drive-in, FM broadcasts, Zoom, uh, Google meetings, uh, outdoor worship. There's lots of different ways people are doing this, and maybe some of them are already getting inside the building again in certain places where that's permissible. Uh, but it's just been remarkable how uh, well uh, people have been. As I've talked to pastors, uh, the vast majority of them are busier than they've ever been. But they report to me that um, there's people in the community that have an interest in God in the church that uh, is cropping up now and not at other times. So praise God for that. I remember after 911, it was a terrible time. And for six weeks, people had the name of God on their lips because uh, it had been just so devastating and so unique. And yet after six weeks, they hadn't become an active part of a church, it wasn't going to happen because everything just kind of slipped back in normal. And I, I think that's going to happen uh, this time too. But we praise God for those that have come along and for churches that are assembling, like you dear folks, staying together in Bible study. Uh, and uh, I don't have a report on your giving, but as I hear about all the churches as a whole, um, it seems like churches are giving uh, about four out of five people are giving what they normally give. So we're, we're doing an excess of 80%, maybe 82, 85% uh, as a, a network of churches throughout the states. And that's good. That means that uh, electricity is being paid and pastors uh, have groceries in their refrigerator and uh, ministries continue on. And God bless you all, because I know you have to make an extra effort to do that. Now, today... Uh, we want to look in Psalm 127. Psalm 127. And the title of my message is, Don't Waste Your Time. And my goal is not to waste too much of your time uh, this morning either. Now, let me first just read from uh, the Psalms, Psalm 127. And if you're brand new and you've got a Bible nearby, open it up because you always get more out of looking at the Bible and listening than just listening. Uh, Psalm 127 is a very short one, uh, and it, uh, it says this, Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of this portion of his word. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to verse 1. In fact, I'm going to spend most of my time in the first half of verse 1. Um, and, and in verse 1, um, I, I think I mentioned Hebrew writing, uh, Hebrew poetry to you one of the times I was with you before. Uh, here we have an example in verse 1 of Hebrew parallelism. 
parallelism, two things that are kind of uh, going parallel to each other. They're um, um, pretty much the same. You can have um, uh, similitude, uh, in other words, uh, two things that are kind of being repeated, the same thing it's being repeated. Uh, or you can have uh, dissimilitude. You can have uh, the first thing says one thing and the second says the opposite, something different. This is the similar parallelism. You can see it starts with unless the Lord and it ends with in vain. And the second half of the verse starts with, unless the Lord, and ends with, in vain. So it's kind of the same thing. It's saying that, that without God, there's something that's being wasted. It's no value. Uh, it's worthless. It's uh, empty. It's vain. But there's a little difference. And uh, I think I may have told you this before. Uh, if not, it's another church somewhere down in that area that uh, they say those two things the same, pretty much the same, but there's always a little difference. A and the fact that there are two that are the same with a little difference highlights that difference. And the difference is the first time through, unless the Lord builds the house, it talks about a builder. And then the second time through, it talks about a guard or a watchman. We see somebody kind of like on the, the wall of the city and he's up high and he's looking out for trouble. Because if he sees trouble coming, he yells, um, close the gate, call out the guard. And uh, if it's just like uh, you had to keep the door of your house, so to speak. This is the door of the city. You had to keep it open because there's traders coming in and out, you know, with uh, various goods and people are visiting their families and families are coming to visit you. So the gate during the day is kept open. Nighttime was often shut. Uh, and the, the watchman's up there to tell you, is somebody sneaking up on you at night, or do you need to close the door, uh, the gate, uh, the gates, uh, during the day? Uh, and, and so uh, it's pretty much the same. There's something that's going to be wasted without God, but a little bit different. First, we're talking about a builder, then we're talking about a watchman. So the first part, and we would call this uh, verse 1a, if you're writing things down, 1a, 1b. Um, 1a um, is verse 1a talks about a house. Now, are we talking about the physical building, the house, or are we talking about the family that lives in the house? In English, we use the word house and household. Household is the people that live in the house, and house is the actual building. In many other languages, uh, you can say the same thing with the same word, and it's that way. Um, uh, in many African languages, uh, the few that I know they use the same word to, um, uh, to, to say the physical building and to say the um, people that are in that um, physical uh, building. Uh, and, uh, and there's a lot that's communicated just by that one word. Uh, I'm waving because we've got some new people that have just come to worship uh, with us. Uh, they're in my house. <laughs> I've got people on the other side of my study, and I'm just waving to my mother-in-law and my wife, who finished uh, another worship service, and they're joining us. It's amazing what you can do with Zoom, isn't it? In my wife's class, she had uh, three pastor's wives and two missionaries, American gals, in Hungary. So you mentioned some people might be visiting you from other places in the world, and we had that visiting with us, uh, even though uh, that class was just being taught from uh, the dining room. And now we've got all kinds of people gathered around, even though we're just uh, teaching here from my uh, place where I, I study. But I'm talking about the, the word that can mean house uh, or, uh, or home. And so... Um, I, I remember one time we were in the bush taxi going down the road in Africa and we we're stopped at a checkpoint. And I'm telling you what, with all the terrorism that's going on in the places uh, where we go in Africa, there's more and more checkpoints all the time. And they, uh, and you have to give a greeting when you start and say, you know, how are you? Um, how's your uh, family? But you use the word house. You have to pick the right language, but you pick some language. And uh, we can say that in four, five, six. We use about six different languages, and I probably can ask how your family is in four or five of them. And you're using the same word, house or family, 
in most of those languages. One, uh, it's different, but most of them, it's the exact same word. And so we, we do the greeting, how's your family, how's your house? It means, how's your family? And he's asking mine, we're saying everything's fine, we're doing well. And it says passport, so I give him the passport. And uh, this guy was being very thorough. Uh, normally, if you just show my passport, I'm at the, I'm right shotgun at the front. Uh, it's good enough for everybody. But then if they want some more, then they go to the men. This guy was very thorough. He went for the men and the women and had a, an, a missionary in the back that was sitting there. And, he, uh, and the, uh, the police officer asks him, where's your passport? And he said, uh, I left it back in my house. Now he used the word for family or house. You can tell in the context. I didn't leave it back in my family. I left it in my house in the building. And if I had said I left the thing at home, he'd say, what's the matter with you? Um, but because this guy could talk fluent in the language of the police officer, the guy said, oh, oh you're a local. No problem. You left it at home. Doesn't matter. <laughs> for me, I got to have it with me. For him, and we're both people from the same country, but for him, he spoke the language well, and so it really, really didn't matter. We're using the word house or family, and you have to listen to the conversation to know, am I saying, how's your family? Or is he saying, I left my passport in my house? Now, which one is being used here in Psalm 127? Well, you look at the context. By the time you get down to verse 3, 4, and 5, now, I mean, you start out, it sounds like building a house. Oh, we know it's got to be the physical building because you're, you know, you're building, uh, making a wall or or a roof or something, put in a door. So you're building, this is Psalm 127, verse one. Um, so you're, uh, you're building uh, uh, the physical building, we're pretty sure. But no, 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 because if you look down at verses three, four, and five, children, 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 so you can tell, parents, so you can tell, ah, in this context, we're talking uh, about, really talking about the family. We start out thinking about a person who's building his actual physical household. But we realize eventually that this is a metaphor because a parent that's investing in their children to teach them right and wrong and model to them how they should live, they are building in their family. So now we understand we're talking about family here. Um, but why does it say in vain? Why does it say it's a waste of time? It's a waste of time trying to build in your family trying to build up your family to try to instruct and teach and influence your family. It's a waste of time if the Lord is not involved, if God is not in it. Now, I don't mean like a picture in the background that says, uh, you know, God's the head of the home. I don't mind. I don't, I don't mean just saying the word God, God wants you to do this. I mean that you have genuinely in your heart, in your mind, in your spirit, you have to be relying upon God and being guided by his spirit in what you're doing. So uh, there's two mistakes here in this first part of verse one. The first mistake is not building into the family. And it's so necessary to do that. I would say at least three things here, and one of them is going to be the law. <laughs> but the first thing I would say is that strong families do not happen on their own. Um, I went to, uh, I, I got to a very, very long master's degree in Dallas, Texas, a four year degree, four years, one summer. And the prerequisites were just amazing. You had to have this to get into this program. And, um, one of my favorite profs would always say, if your neighbor comes to you and says, Oh, you're so lucky. You've got such green grass. Well, in Texas, anybody that's got green grass, um, in most parts of Texas, uh, it's because they've done a lot of work. They've sown the right seed and they watered the thing and they cut it right. And you got to keep it going because there's some merciless heat going on out there. And, uh, and if you've got a good lawn, it's not just luck. Somebody has made some effort to have that happen. Same thing with family. I don't know if you've ever had that happen. I bet some of you have. That someone goes up and congratulates you. Oh, you're so lucky. You've got such a good family. You've got such wonderful children. I wasn't very lucky with mine. They, uh, well, my lands that you don't want to embarrass them and tell them, but if there's something good going on in your family, it's not luck. It's been some hard work and, and, uh, and probably some work with God because kids with all the wonderfulness about them, they've got a sin nature and they learn from their parents who also have sin natures. 
and that you have to invest in them. If you fail to build into the family, it's not going to get there on its own. And you can tell it this day a lot more than you could tell it in our country 50 years ago, because more and more people know how to make babies, but having a clue what it is to have a family. They don't even know how to keep a promise. I'm going to stay with you to death. Do us part. Or uh, maybe till I change my mind. And I just get tired. And person after person, the, 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 the times has taught them. If it's not working out, it's always the other person's fault. And so just get divorced. And get another one and try it again. And yet the amazing thing is, uh, and the record I know is hearing from somebody with seven marriages in their, in their history, you can marry as many times as you want. But if you always think the problem with the other marriage was the other person and you never learned what problems you're bringing into it yourself, you're going to keep adding people to that list of failed marriages. And, and then finally, at least what I look, you know, after a time or two or three, some people finally get to the place where they realize, uh, I have to probably contribute a little to this myself. It's not just finding another person. Or they just get tired of being divorced and married and divorced and married and decide, I think I'm going to stick this thing out even though it's not perfect. And, and they start to learn something that they should have known before they even started, if their family had trained them up. So families are not just going to happen on their own. Now, uh, my church family was greatly, greatly blessed in January. We went over to Africa. It was my 30th time. It was their 29th time. And we got to, this is just the opportunity of a lifetime. We had the opportunity to train 50-some church planters that are going, African church planters that are going out into the bush. And they're going places uh, where no uh, American could ever go. And probably an African with good sense wouldn't go there too. One of the dear brothers stood up and he walked into Libya without any identification, without a password. He learned, you better have some identification when you do this. Libya, where there's no government, it's lawless. Whoever has the most guns is in charge in that particular city. And even the taxi drivers, you can pay them, but they won't take it to, they'll take you close to a city, but they'll stop and they'll say, that's where you're going. Good luck. I hope you don't get shot <laughs> because it's just lawless. And this guy said, oh, I went in there. And uh, why well, was he went all through the country and then went to another country. And he lost everything that he had. He was put in jail. He was threatened with murder. Uh, and uh, he, he never knew what was going to happen the next day. God looked after him completely. That guy came back with two lessons. Number one is, if God sends you to share the gospel somewhere, it doesn't matter where it is. You can take it. And he learned a second lesson. Don't go to Libya without papers. It is very, very hard. We got to train these people, just remarkable, godly, courageous men and women. Just amazing the opportunity that we had. It might be the last opportunity we had because times have changed. But we, we were able to go there. The country still owns two cities. The rest of the country is under the domination of terrorists. But there's two cities, and we were in one of them. Um, and uh, safely got between the two cities by a very fast bus. And we were grateful for that, too. And we, we got to train these people. But because of the influence of uh, African society that had not been informed by Christianity, and because of the influence of Islam, we found that these brave, courageous leaders would tell anyone anywhere about the gospel. They would tell anyone anywhere about uh, loving God and loving each other, except they would not talk with their own family because that's how they're trained. We had to divide them up and uh, uh, two uh, American pastors and a couple of African pastors. They were all pastors and church planters, but the ones that were knowledgeable, we had to kind of work on the others who were pretty sure that women are devils and you shouldn't talk to them. <laughs> now, this especially uh, uh, applied to the one that you're married to. And African society had taught them that. From a, a young man, you were taught this, and you were taught that your ancestors would rise up from the dead and strike you dead. If you ever, if a man ever told a woman the secrets of a man, which included, don't ever tell secrets to women. Isn't that terrible? 
And what broke through is Christianity. When people trusted Christ, they would go home and tell their wives all of the bad stuff they'd been taught. And the village would notice that the ancestors did not come back and kill them. So other men realized it's safe for us to talk to our wives. Can you imagine that? We went over there to train them what the Bible says about church planting. And we did a lot of that. But we also had to train them what the Bible says about building up your own family. You have to talk to your wife. You need to train your children, particularly men, uh, weren't too good at talking to their children. But, you know, in the United States, we don't have necessarily the influence of Islam or African society that we can blame, ancient African traditional society. I don't know what we're going to blame here, but we've got the same problem in too many places that people don't train their families. Husbands and wives talk about a lot of things. They can talk about football or they can talk about groceries, but they don't necessarily talk about the Lord. So even here, we need to remind each other that you, you have to build into your family, that you need to do that. You need to teach them how to pray. And I was thinking back, I don't know, maybe we did. I don't know if we ever sat down and said, uh, this is step A, close your eyes. This is step two, bow your head, fold your hands. I don't know if we ever did any of that, but I knew we didn't have a whole lot when we were younger and we did a lot of just praying. And we knew it was the right thing to do. Pray with your children, pray Pray for your children, pray with your children, and, and uh, we prayed together. And I can tell you this, whatever else they believe or don't believe, they still believe in prayer because they, they are adults with all, their own children and teaching them how to pray. But if there's a problem, they'll call or text or something, pray. Mom, dad, man, pray. This is what's going on because we didn't just say, now someday learn how to pray. They saw us pray. They saw prayers answered, and they learned a little bit about how to pray. I'm not going to say they're experts. I'm certainly not an expert. But this is one of the things you need to do. You need to teach in your family. How do you pray? You need to teach them how to study the Bible. I told them it was important to study the Bible. I don't think as children I taught them enough of how do you study the Bible. Teach them how to witness. Well, I, I, I know I did that because uh, at least two times when my son was still in elementary school, we found him... Um, sharing the gospel with a family dog. And he would smile and say, well, I know, Dad, uh, we're not too sure if dogs are in heaven, and we know that they probably can't get saved, but I wanted just to make sure. And so he would have them cross their paws, and, uh, and he would tell them, repeat after me, and he would share the gospel with them. And I just think that's so sweet, you know, a child's heart. But it also was a sign that they were learning they, they knew what they could share the gospel with friends. They could share the gospel with a dog. And dogs particularly a good one to practice on because they don't uh, normally talk back. Um, you need to teach them how to encourage other Christians. Uh, uh, you need to uh, teach in your family um, how to suffer. Well, thank God for the uh, African-American church. For 200 years, they were famous for um, a number of things, good things gospel music, but one of them was a robust theology of suffering. So a lot of people today, if something goes wrong, say you have a pandemic and people are like whining. This thing has lasted more than five days. Hey, <laughs> there's folks that are dying here. You know, it's not that bad. It's not that hard. They don't have a theory of any kind of suffering. Thankfully, the African American church taught that for many, many years. I think all of us, we've become so prosperous, we got to still remember uh, the, the Bible talks about suffering, too. If suffering, ha uh, we don't need to try to suffer, but suffering is going to come. And when it comes, we need to know how to, uh, how does God think about that? We need to pass that on uh, to children. Uh, we need to ask, what is God teaching you? Uh, maybe share, what, uh, what's God teaching me? Uh, maybe not every hour, maybe not even every day. But that's something that we need to be doing. If nothing other than it's encouraging people to make sure that God is teaching them something. You just don't stop at some place at night. You keep on um, uh, learning about things. So I mentioned the pandemic. Uh, gosh, uh, uh, on our televisions uh, and videos, it's so, so sad what's happened in our country of late. We've seen yet uh, another example of some blatant 
uh, racism. Uh, that dear fella in Minneapolis, he might have been guilty of something or not guilty of something, but whatever was going on, it wasn't worth what happened to him in the least. Now, what do we think about that? And are, are we, you know, and what, I'm going to act like I'm an expert on racism? I don't, I, I don't think so. There's so much, so much to learn. There, there's so much that people feel that I don't even sense at all. I, I'm not the where it's there, except I listen to my sisters and I listen to my brothers who are African American or Asian or Hispanic. And, and I try to see through their, their eyes because you don't always see these things. You don't always see them. You don't always feel them. So you've got to find the people that are feeling them and seeing them and ask them, what is it, brother? What is it, sister? Help me to learn. And, and this is something that families need to pass on so that they understand this is out there. How do we respond to it? Uh, peaceful protests. We should be, teach that. I don't know that I'm any expert in it, but I, I know before my kids graduated from high school, I made sure that uh, we went on at least one peaceful protest uh, together uh, with lots and lots of other people. And that's a great experience to know that in the United States, you're free to stand up and, 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 and uh, uh, try to say something's wrong. And, and this is how it should be righted. Uh, how, how do you think about uh, riots? How do you think about injustice? Uh, those uh, dear three police officers that stood there and didn't tell the fourth one, get your knee off his neck. <laughs> they were wrong. Somebody should have taught them that. Treat a person like with respect. Treat them like a person. Um, how about people are saying, hey, let's go out and hurt some police officers. Let's burn down some buildings. Let's steal some um, $100 sneakers or some uh, television sets. Somebody's standing around and should probably say, hey, bud, let's go someplace else. This is not something that's going to honor God. We need to get out of that. Families, these are things that we can discuss and we can figure out where do we go? What do we do? And it, if more families had taught those things, there'd be fewer need to stand up and say, this is wrong and that's wrong. I remember um, nobody taught me about racism uh, per se, but I was taught to love God and love people. Uh, afterwards, I, I found out my mom, when my school was integrated, I was just elementary school. She was gently asking just to see if I noticed any difference. I said, no. She said, are there any different teachers in your school? Oh, there's some new teachers. Anything different about them? I said, no. And she was, she wanted me to notice, well, some of them had dark skin. We'd never had dark skin teachers before. Didn't seem difference to me. They were, they were men, they were women, just like all the others. And, and I, I, I would thank God that my parents taught that to me, to, to love people and respect people and not to think differently about folks. So when I was in junior high and the uh, son of an angry, violent Ku Klux man was in my class, Ku Klux Klansman. And he was telling me all the vitriol that he has been shared. Uh, and uh, I just responded, no, that's not true. And he said, oh, but this paper says it's true. Oh, no, that's not true because the Bible says otherwise. And I, he didn't have anything worth listening to whatsoever. No, he hadn't teach me any of that bad stuff. I just had to be taught the good stuff. And you can recognize the bad was bad when it was put up with the good. We need to invest in our families and teach them things like that. Uh, teach them concern for other people, concern for the disadvantaged, concern for uh, the disabled. Uh, at your convention, the Baptist Convention in Maryland, Delaware, has really been working on uh, that in the last number of years. Of course, you know, when there was rioting in Baltimore, we jumped right into that too. We were right in the heart of the whole thing and uh, handing out bottles of water and food and handing them out to the police and the National Guard and the demonstrators and the dear fellow that died, his pastor was there and the family and all. And, and it was really, really nice how the church could kind of bridge between the two opposing sides, and then the greater church, churches from the outside could kind of come in and support it, which is something practical, like shovels and plastic bags for cleanup and food uh, and water. Just say, look, we got this in common. We all get hungry, and uh, let's just share this together. It doesn't matter what color you are, where you live in the city. Uh, we all get hungry. Let's work on this thing uh, together. The convention's also working really, really hard on trying to give more information about the disabilities and helping people that are just different because that's the big problem. You know, we all like people that are just like us, but can we like people that are not like us? Um, and that's, uh, 
That's just stuff that we need to do or else we're making the mistake in verse 1 of not being builders, consciously building into our families. But there's a second mistake in the first half of verse 1. And that second mistake is trying to do it without God working through you. Because without God, it's all wasted. But with God working through you, thing, things happen. You can't earn your salvation. You have to find what's God's way. You can't become holy without God. You've got to have God working through you to help you to handle the hurts and the hang-ups uh, and the habits that are, just make life really, really hard. God's the one that's got the life-changing power. If the Lord is not at the center of all of the, the influence, all of the teaching, all that you've accomplished in your family, what part of it's going to last in our families for eternity anyway? What if they learn how to become rich and popular and famous and we don't see them in heaven? It's not worth anything. That's the second mistake. First mistake is not investing, building into our family. The second mistake is doing it apart from God, thinking you can do it on your own. And I guarantee you this, if you and I do not take the time to build into our families, into our children, into our grandchildren, into our uh, ne nephews and nieces and, and anybody that's nearby that'll hold still long enough for us to love on them and hug on them when we're allowed to do that again, the world will. If we don't build into them, the world will. The world will put their, their message in. You know who the God, the little G God of this world is? It's Satan. He's got a plan, and he's sharing his plan. Are we sharing God's plan? That's the point. Well, that's all just in the first half of verse 1. The second half of verse 1, it's the same thing for the city. It's the same thing. If you don't watch a city, it's a waste. And if you do watch a city apart from God, it's going to be wasted too. What if you protect your city and it's lost for all eternity? And these two are fitted with each other because I think there's a link. If you build into your family, you're building into your city. A church full of families that are building into their family is protecting their city. We need more families building in the cities. So there's all, all the cities with all the problems all across the United States, all across the world, there's all kinds of things that need to be solved. But a lot of solutions starts right from, the, right from the foundation of God in the home with a spiritual leader or pair of parents building into the family so they can make a difference in their city. And if we don't do that, then it's all for nothing. Let me tell you a quote from uh, Howard Hendricks, my, my favorite professor in seminary. He's with the Lord now. He was trying to make a difference in his family and in his city. And he, he prayed, God, change my wife, change my children, change my students. And he said, God never answered that prayer. Then he changed his prayer. God, change my wife's husband. Change my children's father. Change my student's teacher. And he said, God started answering and never stopped answering that prayer. He had to have God working in his life, and then God could work through him and change his home and his city. And because he's perhaps the greatest Christian education influence in the 20th century, changed many things throughout the world. And so we just summarize in this first verse, an effort to build into your family or to guard your city without God is a complete waste. And the rest of the scripture, the uh, rest of this chapter is very, very simple. Uh, the second point would be in verse two, because I'm going to give you the whole thing, but really, really fast. In, in other places, particularly Proverbs, you know, like with the ants, it values hard work. But this one has another thing here. It says that God has, uh, that God's blessing has more value than just simple hard work. And that's why being a workaholic without God it's a waste. That's verse 2. And in verses 3, 4, and 5, children are a blessing. Verse 3, they're a gift from God. Verses 4 and 5, when you get old, and some of us are getting a little older now, those children, they can be a blessing, can't they? And those verses talk about that more. But the big point of this whole chapter is that 
You can't do this apart from God. Because look at who, who wrote Psalm 127. Solomon, credit as perhaps the wisest man who ever lived. And yet, did he invest in his family and build that wisdom into his family? No. So what was his legacy? The wisest person in the world, his legacy was division. He was the last king of a united Israel. Because from his, from his descendants on, they never were together again. What's your legacy? And what's my legacy? Are we taking time to make sure that God has our own heart? And then are we making time that as we're learning day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, to pray really hard for, and particularly when our children are young, invest in them, to train them, and to model to them all these various things and many more that you can think of that are in part, uh, important for a family to learn. It's a big mistake not to build into your family or watch your city, but it's an even bigger mistake to think that you can do it on your own without God. You can't get saved on your own. You got to say, I can't do it. I need God. You can't become holy on your own. You've got to say, God, would you come in and would you do in my life? Would you give me the strength that I don't have myself to resist that sin? And we need God if we're going to build into our family too. Don't waste your time. Because if you fail to build in your family or you build into them, don't, don't let the Lord work through you. It is a waste of your time. And I want to pray for you and for me that we would not waste our time. Uh, there might be another brother that's going to pray in a moment. I'm not sure. Uh, but I'm going to pray right now, if that's okay. Your gracious Father, we thank you for the clarity of your word. Father, we see that the world has not changed in these thousands of years, that families still need you, that cities still need you, a nation still needs you. Lord, may it start with us that we are serious and genuine with you this day, talking to you through prayer, listening to you in your word. And that as we invest in our families, our, our, our church family invests in their families, that we might be able to make an impact, at least in the neighborhoods where we are. And it might go on for the benefit and the blessing of so others who desperately need to know about you. I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you, Dr. Duggar. Um, just as a reminder, after worship, uh, you may remain connected for uh, fellowship. Uh, Dr. Gregor, if you would, please uh, send us away with uh, the benediction. Okay. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you. And as you trust in him, may you find his peace. Amen. Amen.